Good morning, everyone. We have a couple of things that we're going to need to take care of this morning. And that is, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, this is the Empowerment Series, video number 26. There will be three parts to this series. This is how to engage small claims court and how to win in small claims court. First, we need to lay the ground rules for small claims court. What are those ground rules? The reason you're going to small claims court is not to get a monetary judgment for any of the things the idiots have done to you. Whoever it is, you're taking to small claims court. You don't want a monetary judgment for the damages caused, so you do not want to bring a claim for compensation. You don't ever want to bring a claim for compensation in small claims court because the compensation is limited. What you're looking for is a judgment in small claims court for violations. Once you get a judgment in small claims court, then you can actually go for compensation and punitive damages for damaging you and your property. Now, what's the difference? Well, small claims court has a limit, statutory limit, statute because the statute limits the amount that you can get in small claims court. That's their jurisdiction. It's their statutory limit. So that is the limit and jurisdiction of small claims court. That is their jurisdiction. So you don't need to challenge the jurisdiction. Small claims court is voluntary. Nobody forces you to go into small claims court. But you shouldn't go into their courts at all. Shut up. Stop listening to that stupidity. Let's see if I can explain it better this way. When I first got my start, Back in 1983, I tell everybody about how I received a traffic ticket. Officer giving me a ticket for something or another. I received tenant window tickets. I received, um, haven't really received speeding tickets, but I have received tenant window tickets and um, exhibition of speed because I went around a turn and you could hear my tires screeching. It wasn't speeding though. The tires were you know, on their way out. But anyway, um, and I had to go to court for these tickets. At the age of 15, I didn't know nothing about tickets and having a car. I just wanted a car. Didn't know anything about the responsibilities for having a car. Did not receive any tickets for no insurance and all that stuff because at that time, you weren't required to have liability insurance. That didn't come for another, I think, two years. However, let's pay attention so that you get it. When I went into court, there was nobody else there, no family members, no friends, nobody on my side. I was there by myself, 15 and a half year old kid going into small claims court. And the judge, pay attention, instead of saying, hey, um, since you don't have a parent here, we're going to have to appoint an attorney for you. No, he didn't do that. He says, you're going to have to handle this by yourself. Do you think you can do that? Yeah, I can handle that. That was my response. How much time do you need? Does two weeks sound okay? Yeah, two weeks should be fine. <clears throat> no, I was just agreeing. Two weeks? Yeah, that's enough time for me to handle something. Ladies and gentlemen, I went and I did my research for two weeks. I think it was... Now, I want to let you know my father had a mechanic. And I would talk to him about all things automobiles. Because he, when I, uh, my car wouldn't start one day, the battery was dead. And I didn't know what was going on. And it was to use Ford Pinto. And he said to me, yeah, I could repair that. And I said, okay, how much did it cost me? Oh, he says, no, 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 you're going to pay me, but you're going to do the work. I looked at him, excuse me? What do you mean I'm going to pay you and then I'm going to do the work? If you've ever, ladies and gentlemen, paid attention to the rich dad, poor dad, that's exactly the mindset of adults back then. To teach you, not give you a fish, but to teach you how to fish. His words to me was, if I do the work for you, then you'll keep paying people to do stuff that you can do yourself. However, if I teach you how to do it, then you'll end up doing it yourself and saving yourself a lot of money in the long run. So he taught me how to put in an alternator, which now is second nature. My grandfather can put in an alternator, you know, 
I could put in an alternator in 15 minutes. And that's taking my time. From one demonstration. Now, it took about an hour, but he stood there the whole time while I was doing it. Now, he had a business, but he took the time to show me away from his business. So I would go there and I'd just talk to him. I'd just sit there while he would work and we would talk. And so I talked to him about going to court and he told me what he knew. And one of the things he taught me about going into court was going to the court and sitting there and just listening and seeing how they do things. Then he says, and after you listen, you want to listen for the things that the judge is saying and that the attorneys are saying. You want to see what the judge is saying you can't do and what the judge is saying you can do. I did that for three straight days. <laughs> Some kids showing up in court and just sitting there with notebook and pen in hand. People say, I don't have that type of time. Nobody asked you. Literally, nobody asked you. Nobody sat up here and asked you, do you have time? If you want to learn how to fish, you're going to have to make the time. I didn't have to sit there for five or six hours. I went there on my days off. Small claims court happens every day, people. Every single day. Evictions are small claims court, if you guys don't get it, if you don't understand. That's why you're not allowed a jury trial in most eviction uh, cases throughout the United States. Some states do allow for a jury trial. But in most evictions, you're not allowed a jury trial. It's the same court as small claims court. It is small claims court, people. I won that case. And I won subsequently every other case after that, with the exception of two that I had to appeal and one on appeal. Really was that simple. Why? Because small claims court, the only thing you have to do is have proof and evidence. And you always challenge their evidence. Really simple. People say, well, that doesn't, that's not that simple. If I can understand it at the age of 15, you can understand it at the age of 16, 17, 18, 19, or 20. Yeah, that's right. I'm giving some of you a lot of credit. Okay, calling you 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds or 20 year olds, okay? So let's get to it, shall we? So that we can show you how things are done in small claims court. We're going to start with something. We're going to put forth the fact. Now, this is the fact right here requiring write off of doubtful, or worthless assets of banks. Many of you have accounts with financial institutions. No, we're not talking about the mom and pop store. We're talking about big accounts, you know, mortgages, car loans, student loans. Many of you have that. And so let's see how we get some act right. Now, there's going to be two segments to that. Now, this is going to be a series. So I want you all to get some coffee. And just, you don't have to take notes. It's on video. You don't have to take any notes. It's on video. Okay. So give me a second, please. And we'll be right back. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. There was a couple of hiccups, so it's been about 30 minutes. However, that doesn't stop the fact that we're going to have this conversation and we're going to get to talk about quite a few things. What you need to understand about small claims court, there are some misnomers. First, you can't sue a corporation in small claims court. Now, you heard what I just said. You cannot sue a corporation in small claims court. Small claims court helps individuals and corporations resolve disputes when the amount of the claim is $10,000 or less. The reason why you can't sue a corporation in small claims court, even though they say you can sue a corporation in small claims court, is because once you sue a corporation in small claims court, in most states, they can elect to have the case removed to the regular superior court or county district court or county circuit court and that way you lose your leverage because now you have to deal with attorneys you have to deal with all of those little mundane rules the reason why you go to small claims court so you don't have to deal with all those stupid rules you don't have to deal with all of the little formalities of regular court where they you got to jump through this hoop and then you got and once you jump through that hoop you got to jump through another hoop oh and do not do not go to the clerk of the court and ask them any questions. Why? Because they will lie to you. Remember, most of these clerks have been doing this job for years, day in, day out, all day, every day. 
So if they tell you something and you later find out that they gave you the wrong information, you must understand one thing and one thing only. They did it intentionally. It was not a mistake. I have too many people that I talk to on a regular basis who say, well, the clerk told me all I needed to do was this. Yes, but they left out this and they left out that. So if you do that, then you're going to end up losing. And that's been the case with several of them because they chose to listen to the clerk as opposed to listening to me. I have more experience than most clerks. But individuals will choose to listen to them because they have a title. So be that as it may. Let's continue. Why can't you sue a corporation in small claims court? You don't sue the corporation, ladies and gentlemen. You sue the CEO, the CFO, or the COO. Whoever is an officer of the corporation, that's whom you're suing. Why? Because that's the person who has to show up in court. Well, they don't know nothing about the law. <laughs> They're just like you. That's why you want to pull them into court. And you don't sue them if they breach the contract then you don't sue them for breach of contract. Pay attention. You sue them for, and you look through the contract and you find one thing or two things that you can put your teeth onto. By doing this, they breached that provision of the contract. You got to be very specific. You cannot say the whole contract. You cannot say everything they did violated the entire terms of the contract. Can't do that because now you just stabbed yourself in the back and the foot and the head and the side of the neck and you hit every major artery that is associated with your life, your right to petition, and the life of your case. You don't need to be killing your case from the very beginning. What am I trying to say? Ladies and gentlemen, small claims court is a technicality court. You can sue for the technicality. For instance, you sue per issue. You don't sue per dollar amount. You sue for violation of a code, a law, a statute, such as the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, or the Consumer Credit Protection Act. You go through there and you find violations. You list two or three per lawsuit. You can go after that very same CEO, CFO, or whomever you want, repeatedly in the same court. And there's nothing anybody can do about it. Nothing anybody, they can't bring up a previous case or anything like that because you must make sure that while you're in small claims court that you stick to the issues. You don't let them talk about everything and anything else. Don't let them bring up anything else. Say, objection, that is not the subject matter of the instant matter. I don't care if it's related. I want it to be known that that is not the reason we're here and that's not what I am bringing my claim for. My claim is specific to the matters at hand. Why? Because you want to give yourself, let's say you lose, you're going to appeal. Appeals are very nominal. The, the fees are nominal. They're not five, six hundred, eight hundred dollars $800. They're nominal fees. I'm getting ready to go out to a court right now because they pretended to play games with me. They played games with me. And so now I get to get their attention. But because I'm too busy doing this for you all, I am going to make this week the week that I finish my paperwork and get that stuff off to the court and start going. Because i got to get their attention. They, the courts will play games with you. The clerks will play games with you. So that's why you go after whomever it is that wants to play games. You go after them in small claims court, but you don't go after them directly. These companies you're dealing with go after their insurance. Now, not every company has insurance. The smaller companies don't have insurance. Most of them go by and deal without insurance. Limited liability corporations don't have insurance. You still sue them in small claims court. That's why they're limited liability. Sue them in small claims court. Why small claims court? Because a judgment in small claims court is still a judgment. And once you get a judgment in small claims court, now you can sue on the other issue in the superior court or the county district court or the county circuit court. Now you can take them to the big game fish. You just can't bring up any of the issues you brought up in small claims court. The only thing you can say is that, especially if you have a win, 
is that it's already been adjudicated that they violated the policy, they violated the contract. And so because of that, I'm bringing this case based on that adjudication. Not the issues in that adjudication, but the issues dealing with the fact that they breached the terms of the contract. Now you can bring up everything else in the other court. The reason why you can't bring up the same things is because of the double jeopardy law. Double jeopardy means that no one may be subjected to double jeopardy. It's called the double jeopardy principle. Double jeopardy normally applies to criminal matters. However, it's the principle of double jeopardy that applies to civil matters. Yes, double jeopardy is a principle. Now look, pay attention. Small claims court, often referred to as the people's court, is the place where you get relatively quick and simple resolutions to civil matters, not criminal disputes. I want all of you to understand, I've been telling you that small claims court is the people's court. Told you Judge Wapner, that was small claims court, where you have to agree to be there, where the people have agreed to be in this, our form, the people's court. They told you, and, and I watched, I promise you I've watched just about every episode of the people's court. Because it's the same thing. The principles are going to be pretty much the same. You're not going to find too many variations between small claims court. Why? Because it's arbitration. Usually, the small claims court judge, it's an attorney who's trying to become a judge. So they're called magistrates. Okay? Usually, that's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with a bar card carrying agent. Do you have a right to a judge in a small claims matter? Yes, you have the right to request that the matter be presided over by a judge and not a magistrate. You do have the right to be before a judicial officer. Do not let anybody tell you that you do not have that right. Watch. Wake up. Wake up. How to demand the case be heard by a judge and not a magistrate. Stop listening. Stop listening. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. We're having a little bit of delay, and I'm going to explain why we're having that delay. Where are you? Nope, I can't explain it. There is, we're transferring files, and because I'm transferring files from one hard drive to the next, it's eating up some of my system's resources, so I apologize for that. And that'll be taken care of on its own time. We'll get to that at another time. When someone owes you money, nobody cares about that. I asked how to get before a judge and not a magistrate. Okay. Um, and by the way, yes, if you don't show up, they can go ahead and hear the case without you being there. But we need to make sure of having the matter heard before a judge and not a magistrate. No, uh... Sorry, this is saying nobody asked what is a magistrate. So look, ladies and gentlemen, you have to request a judge and not a magistrate in the original filing. You have to say, I do not waive my right to have this matter heard by a judge. Okay, I demand the matter to be heard by a judicial officer and not a magistrate. Just that simple. Some of you, if you've listened to the magistrate and you've gone in there and you've listened to them, then you may prefer a magistrate because they are probably not going to give you too many headaches. If you ask for a judge, that could take longer. Why? Judges tend to have more cases, more trial cases. And because they tend to have more trial cases where there are jury trials involved, then that means that you're going to wait longer because now you have to be rotated into the docket. All right. All right. Got that taken care of. Now we're going to go to Talk AI. Talk AI.info. Talk AI.info is actually not a bad 
service. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put that statement in requiring proof of debt. This measure would help to improve the transparency and accuracy of financial records of the Federal Reserve Bank by ensuring that doubtful or worthless assets are properly accounted for and are removed from their balance sheet. Write-off of these assets would also help prevent potential losses and ensure that the financial health of the banks are accurately reflected. Additionally, this action may lead to more responsible lending practices and risk management um, within the banking sector. Now, pay attention. Risk management is insurance. That's what it is. Risk management. That's insurance. So basically what I put in there was the statute that says that the banks are required to write off their debts after a certain period of time, which is generally 180 days. All Federal Reserve Banks, remember, whenever Federal Reserve Bank is expressed without the word the Federal Reserve Bank or a Federal Reserve Bank, it means any bank. So, Federal Reserve Banks are required to write off, see, required to write off their worthless debts, IRS tax topic 453. That means they have to file a Schedule C because the law requires any debt above $600 that they must file a 1099C, but they don't give you your copy of that filing. Now you have the law saying that they have to provide that. Okay, let's give you that law real quick. All right, this is Title 12, 248. Okay, G, Title 12, 248, and we're going to go down to G. Title 12, 248, G. I'd rather not give you the USC, but some of y'all won't know how to handle the actual code. So Title 12. 248G. All right. There you go. All right. So watch this. I am doing a small claims lawsuit against Wells Fargo Bank. in small claims court, period. I am bringing this suit against Wells Fargo Bank insurance bond number I'm also bringing it against Wells Fargo Bank comma, insurance company. The bond number will be listed as John Doe 1. And the insurance company listed as Doe 2. CEO of Wells Fargo Bank. Question mark.
the suit will be for the fact that the bank was required to write off the debt prior to seeking foreclosure proceedings, comma, and the Internal Revenue Code, Section 166, required them to produce a 1099-C, evidencing the worthlessness and non-collectability of the debt. of the debt. Period. The law required that they send me a copy showing that the debt had been canceled because it was valued at greater than $600. And they failed to do that. Period. I notified them failed that I needed a copy of their bond information, comma, its value, comma, the identifying information, including the name of the insurance company and contact person. And they failed under the liability statute to provide this information upon notification of a claim, period. It was not their determination as to whether or not the claim was valid or not, comma. As my right to petition for redress is directly related and or associated with that as this is a governing agency issue and the principles of redress apply there too. Period. Can you help me produce a sample template of such a claim? Question mark. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, that's how simple it is. I'm just going to hit the enter button. And let's see. Now remember, I kept it limited. Only the EIN number, not EIN number, but the bond number and the bond insurance company. Oh, it already did it. Oh, my God. Okay. Now, of course, I'll add to this. Now, watch this. Wake up. Wake up. Can you please put that in motion format? Question mark. Uh-oh. Stop listening. Stop listening. Sorry, I told it to put it in motion template. That way, 
and it's already done. Okay, and there you go. You see a little bit more detailed and comes down the plaintiff, blah, 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 moves this honorable court, blah, blah, blah. There you go. Wake up. What are the usual penalties under the liability statute in the state of Washington, comma, if an individual fails to provide liability insurance upon request after a claim of injury, question mark, stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, we're dealing with principles here. So let's see. In the state of Washington, uh-oh, got to go up. In the state of Washington, the usual penalties for failing to provide liability insurance upon request after a claim for injury includes suspension of driver's licenses. Now, again, suspension of their license to practice, the suspension of their license, not license for driving. See, it focused on driving. This has nothing to do with driving. This has everything to do with liability. Now watch this. Wake up. Wake up. What are the penalties for a corporation if it causes damages or injury to a party, comma, and refuses and or fails to provide liability insurance information to the person making such a claim? Question mark. Companies in the United States are required to have insurance, comma, as they agree to sue and be sued as part of their corporate registration process, period. If they cause damage and or injury, a person has the right to redress, i.e. colon, correction of the wrong and reparations and or compensation. Question mark, what is this process for the state of Washington? Question mark, stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter if it's a judge, if it's a plumbing company, it doesn't matter who it is. Many of you guys are having problems with this, so please understand. In the state of Washington, if a corporation causes damages or injury to a party and refuses or fails to provide liability insurance information, the injured party may pursue legal action against the corporation. The penalties for the corporation may include court-ordered injunction, the court may order blah, 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 fines, suspension, civil lawsuit. Here's the fact. Do you notice how it doesn't say, now watch this, it is important for corporations to comply with the legal requirements of having liability insurance or providing the necessary information to injured parties in order to avoid facing these penalties. If you have been injured by a corporation and are having trouble obtaining liability insurance information, you may want to consult with a legal professional and discuss your options with them. So ladies and gentlemen, it's not their choice. It's liability insurance. It's the principles of liability insurance. So just in case you get into an accident and you don't provide liability insurance, that's a violation of the First Amendment. Why? Because everyone has the right to petition for redress of grievances. You cause an injury to a person, that's a violation of common law. Now, what is common law? Most people have misunderstood it to this very day. Common law is the law among the common people for that particular community. Okay, so let's say in your community, it is the people have decided we're not going to allow that here in this community. And as long as it's not an infringement upon another person's right, that becomes the common law for that area. For instance, there are laws in the state of Nevada that don't exist in the state of California. There are laws in the state of California that don't exist in Louisiana. 
Louisiana claims that they're not a common law state. Louisiana doesn't have a choice. Every state is a common law state. Common law means the common law of the people, not the common law of the court. Yes, the court has their own common law. But you're talking about the common people, common law. That's the common law. Go ahead. Think about the word common. The court, or the court of common, please. No, 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 no. Not something that's invented by the court. The word common. Okay, and then look at the word people. That was the common law. No court jurisdiction. No court claims. No court saying that their cases became the common law, that they adopted something. Now, if you don't believe me, go ahead and look up, because the courts have said they adopted the common law of England. Go ahead and look up that statute where Congress said we're officially adopting the common law of England. There's no such thing. Go ahead and look up the law that says that they adopted the laws of England. Because they didn't. Never did they. Now, the courts may have adopted it, but that was their choice, not the people's choice. Okay. Whew. So glad we got this part taken care of. Now, how do we put together a complaint? Well. It's funny you should ask, because we are taking care of that for you. This will be done where it applies to you guys. Now, this has all of the necessary information, including this section, um, 82 stat, 152 and 153. This is that wonderful right of rescission of contract. Because you all know that you are engaged in a contract. Now, some of this might be too much for, oh, this is 18 pages. You see that other, normally small claims court, the uh, complaint is like three or four pages. Not long at all. Okay? But, as I said, I don't have time for games with anyone or anything. So, let's do this so that you guys get it. When you list your Superior Court of Record, whether it be Superior Court, District Court, matter of fact, we'll take care of that now since we're here. No, we're going to make this yellow, too. And for those of you who don't know how to remove this, you simply just have to do the same thing I'm doing. Highlight it, click here, remove it. Okay? So you're going to have to change that. But anyway, you see how it says CEO of the bank corporation, Doe One, then the name of the servicing company. Whoever it is, you put their name here. You don't want to put everybody in their grandfather's name because you want to reserve you're right to sue that person next time. You're suing the person. You're suing under the person's name. You're suing the bonding and insurance company. Then your next lawsuit will be for something else, and your next lawsuit will be for something else. Two or three issues. You're suing for the maximum amount allowed in small claims court. What do we mean by the maximum amount? Some courts, like California, has up their maximum amount to $25,000. Other courts have a $6,000 maximum amount. Other courts have a, pay attention, $3,000 maximum amount. Whatever the maximum amount of the court is, is what you're suing for. Now, you're not suing because your mortgage is worth $150,000. Let's prove it to you. The reason why banks can go into small claims court and get a judgment against you and evict you from your small claims court matter, sorry, it's, um, what is the, there's a software that it's having some complications with, and I haven't figured out what software that is, so give me a second while I take care of that. Let's have you guys find it out. Let's, let's do that. We're going to take you guys here. We're going to ask the question. Now, this is Talk AI, and because... It has literally given our questions, and you don't have to register for talkai.info. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to have an email address. You just use it. So give us a second. I think I may have lost my dragon, and I need my dragon because I need to train it. Um, ladies and gentlemen,
I'm asking a simple question. How can a bank sue in small claims court if the value of the property is greater than $100,000? Bank cannot sue in small claims court for foreclosure if the value of the property is greater than $100,000. Small claims court has a monetary value depending on the jurisdiction. For cases involving properties, the value exceeding $100,000, the bank will need to file a lawsuit. Ah, now watch this. Sorry about this. Basically, I said they cannot, they're right, they cannot sue if the value of the property is greater than $100,000. However, if their claim is for a separate issue, something different than, yes, they can, Barack Obama. Anyway, yes, that is correct. Small claims court is typically used for cases involving disputes over smaller amounts of money rather than complex property disputes. It offers a simplified and expedi expedited process for resolving disputes without the need of a formal legal representation. Pay attention. It's the disputed matter that is the issue, not the value of the disputed matter or the value of the contract or the value of the property. It's the issue that is the matter. So let's break it down. One second. Wake up. Ten general rules of small claims court when initiating a small claims lawsuit? Question mark. Can you also list ways for a pro se litigant to be successful in small claims court who has never utilized the small claims court before? Question mark. At least 20 suggestions, please. Question mark. Stop listening. Okay, that little Jerk showed me that it already done the 20 suggestions. Okay, let's go back to the ways to proceed in small claims court. Know the monetary limits of the small claims court jurisdiction. Ah, we got that one covered. Determine if the person or entity you are suing falls within the jurisdiction. We got that covered too. We suing the CEO and because the contract was in this area, in this state, and because we communicated in this state or one of the parties live in this state, it's called the long arm jurisdiction. I'm assuming this state. Okay. Ensure that you have a valid legal basis for your claim and gather all relevant evidence. Ladies and gentlemen, you have to put together a file. For our clients, we created a file for them and sent them the file. They have all they need. Plus, they have their other documents, Truth and Lending Act statement. This is especially for mortgages. So 
you have to put together the evidence and you have to have a valid claim, which is why we are creating this document for you guys so that you'll have a valid claim. Uh, by the way, the courts have often said individuals are held liable for failing to state a claim whereby uh, relief may be granted. C L A I M. Let's see if there is a stated claim anywhere in here. Well, look at that. They say a small claims court. No, I don't want the, the word small claims court. I want the word claim. Ah, thereby necessitating modification to accurately reflect the claims and damages sought in this higher court. Oh, snap. Hold on. The claim and was denied. Let's get this right here. I only sought to bring the claim and was denied the right via various gatekeeping practices by the defendant insured party. Okay, I have been damaged. My property has been damaged. I have been misinformed through misrepresentation and or misinformation and or failure to act and or failure to inform and or failure to prevent. And I sought to bring the claim and was denied the right haha, <laughs> because I asked for their insurance information. And that's what I was bringing a claim for. And hold on, people, no, not that one, need one more. Ah, statement of claims. Okay, just that simple. This area, we'll do it this way so that you guys will know that you'll have to complete this section by, we're going to go red, okay, by putting in that information. But I haven't finished it yet. It will be finished this week. Yes, it's a lot of work, people. This is not overnight. Got to make sure I word it correctly so it applies to each of you. Now, so we put together our information, our evidence. We bring forth our claim. Complete and file the necessary forms to initiate the lawsuit. What are the necessary forms? We'll go over these forms in the next video. Necessary forms are a cover sheet. The court usually provides their own cover sheet. Then the next form after the cover sheet is the summons. There is a summons that go along with it. The court usually provides that. Then the next form is your complaint, as you just saw right there. Then the next form is a proof of service upon the opposing party. And if you have not served them by the time of the filing, then you notify the court that the parties will be served on or about the date of the filing of this instrument. That's in the certificate of service. And then what other document are necessary for small filing in small claims court? Well, after you have the summons, you have the proof of service, you have the complaint, and you have the cover letter. Ladies and gentlemen, the other thing you're going to need is a subpoena. Yes, you want to subpoena this evidence from them. So you want to get a subpoena from the court. You want to, you just need one subpoena. You have to put in the party's names. You have to put in the caption of the case. You can get a civil subpoena from the court. Civil subpoenas are given by the court all the time. And you want the subpoena to be signed by the clerk in blank. You don't necessarily need the clerk to sign the subpoena. You can sign the subpoena. You are the attorney of record. And under law, attorneys have the right to issue subpoenas for the matter in which they are involved. So you can sign the subpoena. Okie dokie. All right. Now it says, serve the defendant with a copy of the lawsuit and the court hearing details. After you file the lawsuit, you're going to be given some papers. Everything you're given by the court, you need to serve upon the opposing party. Be prepared to attend all court hearings and present your case in a clear and organized manner. Get yourself those files, go to Walmart or any one of those stationery stores, get those little yellow envelopes, and put all of the documents, sort it out, label it, and put all your documents together. And be organized, people. All right. Follow all of the court rules and procedures, including deadlines for filing documents and providing evidence. You want to do that as soon as possible. You don't want to wait till the 14th day. Many of you are procrastinators. Many of you want to wait until you ain't got no more time left and you want to be, oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, and you want to panic. Please stop. Follow, excuse me, consider mediation and settlement. 
you want to tell them, I am willing to mediate this matter. You want to make that clear. You're just going to put together a small little motion, I'm willing to mediate. Because the courts have, in most cases, a mandatory mediation. All you want is the settlement, ladies and gentlemen. All you want is the settlement. Why? Because once you get that settlement, you can use those funds to do the next lawsuit on the next issue. Shh, don't tell nobody. Be respectful to the idiot, I mean the judge, <clears throat> excuse me, and court staff and other parties during the court proceedings. They need to be respectful to me. But don't let your pride get your behind kicked on out of there and your case dismissed because that ain't helpful. Be prepared for the possibility of appealing the case if the court rules against you and be aware of the time limits for filing an appeal. The appeal does not go to the appeals court. It goes to the superior court, which operates as an appeals court, okay, in this instance. So be prepared for that. We'll go over these details uh, momentarily when we do the next two videos. So this is just the beginning, giving you guys a little bit of an idea of how to get started with small claims court, okay? Attorneys, do you need one? No, you don't need an attorney to handle in small claims court, to deal with small claims court. Okay, you don't need an attorney. Sorry, I'm looking at the dog in the, uh, his name is Griff. I'll put a picture of Griff up, but I'm looking at him in my, uh, give me one second, I have to say something to him. Sorry, I, I had to speak to him for a second. He comes right to me when I call his name and his buddy, her name is Eve. She's a boxer. They are literally inseparable. Okay, let's do this right here, ladies and gentlemen. Familiarize yourself with the rules and procedures of small claims court by researching online or contacting the court for information. You wanna go and look at the rules. The first 10 rules, I tell that to everybody when you're dealing with any court, the first 10 rules are usually those rules that you need to know, really off the bat. You follow those and you get into court and you don't have any problems. Do yourself another favor. Take those first 10 rules and put them in ChatGPT. Watch this. Wake up. Rules of small claims court, comma, County of Los Angeles, question mark. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, stop listening. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, the rules of small claims court is going to be the same throughout the state. doesn't matter what county, but do it for your county nonetheless. Okay, now this one's how to sue in small claims court. Now, these are technically the rules. Uh, give me one second. Small claims court, see? Attention, as of all small claims litigants must register small claims court online dispute resolution. Pay attention. That's that mitigation, mediation junk, okay? As of this, they don't want you uh, asking to go to a hearing. They want you to do online dispute resolution. Okay, all small claims throughout the entire state. That's the first thing you need to know. You need to know. <coughs> Excuse me, had to cough. And let's see if I can get the rules. Uh, I don't want that. I want the actual rules. So this is where we're going to go. Small claims basics. What are some of the examples, samples, of handling small claim court claims? How can, who can sue? Okay, we'll do this. Examples of problems that are handled. Okay, so these are problems. You were cheated when you bought your car and want your money back. Your friend asked you for a loan but refused to pay you back. Your tenant caused damage to the apartment. The store refuses to fix or replace your TV, which doesn't work. Then we have your former landlord refused to return your security deposit. 
those are the issues for which you can complain about. How much money can I ask for? I want some money, dude. The maximum amount that you can ask for, now pay attention, individuals or sole proprietorships, they can sue for up to $12,500. Individuals or sole proprietorships. Corporations or businesses can only sue for $6,250. Ain't that something? You can sue for up to, now it says individual sole proprietorship, charged a fee for surety services, did not charge a fee for surety services, charged a fee for surety services. This is the defendant who is the grantor who, blah, 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 who can sue, blah, blah, blah. Now, they have their limitations. Uh, became, okay, an action to recover COVID-9 rental debt that became due between March 2020 and 2021. Okay, they changed the rules. They just make them up randomly. Nobody knows these rules. Okay, but that's why you're required to go to the internet to find out what their stupid rules are. It is advisable that you go over each one of them. Okay, it is advisable that you go over each one of them. The first 10 of them is what you need to know. But you notice how these rules are not the same as superior court rules? Here's the problem, and I do want you to understand. You still pay attention because this is very important because they're not going to tell you this, but I am. First, I'm going to click on forms because you are going to need to know the forms. So we'll let that go to forms. This is self-help. I don't care about self-help, so I'm going to stop that. Watch this. Wake up. Wake up. All right, I put the rules of superior court for the state of California. If your court has a county district court or a county circuit court, you want the rules of the county circuit court or the rules of the county district court or the rules of the municipal court for blah, blah, blah. You want to get the rules of that specific court. Don't do the rules just a small claims court. By the way, I'm not doing that. That's the AI the computer AI that's doing that right there. I'm not clicking on any buttons right now. My hands are not even touching the computer. It's been, that's why I'm having so many problems. The AI has been taking over my system, dude. It's AI. Everything is run by AI now on the internet. This is automated. This is no longer Google having an algorithm and all of that stuff. This is all automated. California court rules. Remember I said the first 10? So you want to do the, court rules, civil rules for your state. And what, again, I'm going to tell you, hold on. It says Title II, and by the way, this is off. Okay, trial court rules, civil rules. And we want the civil rules because it's a civil proceeding. So we're going to go here. Now, you see, that looks like a whole lot, okay? Petitions, proceedings, coordination, management of class action cases. Well, you don't really need to know management of class action cases, but judicial arbitration. Now, listen to that. Why would they have a judicial arbitration, okay? So this seems like it's daunting. That's, woo -wee, that's a whole lot, ain't it? No, it isn't. It's just made to look like a whole lot, but it's not a whole lot. So let's scroll down here. And I said we can go all the way down. And let's see, where are we at? Receivership, notice motion, particular motions, pleading and motions. 
All right. What we're going to do is I'm going to take the whole thing. See all of this right here? Watch this. Now, what you want to do is click on one rule at a time and do what I'm about to do. Okay? Watch this. Copy. And that's the AI system. One second. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, that took about five minutes. It was recording everything I was saying, just as I told you, even though it showed it was off, it recorded. And that's what happens with each of you. One second. I just asked it to go ahead and break down each of these rules for me, and I put the whole list there. You're going to do one rule at a time, and you're going to ask it to explain. Now look, that's, that's how much I'm having to scroll up, because I'm still scrolling up since, <laughs> man. Okay, this rule simply states the title of the rules this rule definition of limited scope and it's going to do that now to initiate a complaint and there you go now it it can't do all of them at once because it's limited but i was just showing you how to do it if you get to a rule and you don't really understand then get it to explain it to you okay the cover sheet remember i told you how every case must have a cover sheet and then it'll go on to tell you about the other things when you go step by step. Oh, by the way, remember, you also have to do the alternative dispute resolution in the state of California. Now, see, I didn't know that until just now. Until just now in doing this video, I did not know that. I have to do the same thing you all have to do. And I don't mind dispute resolution because dispute resolution is basically the law. Okay? And then after you get your dispute resolution, you can hold them, their feet to the fire because you still get to file your claim. By the way, remember, you are filing an insurance claim. You still get to file an insurance claim. And if you don't get your insurance claim, now you get to go after the insurance company for reals. For real, for reals. So, ladies and gentlemen, what you are being told and being made to understand is the reason why you're going to small claims court. A lot of people are not going to take the time to listen to the things that are necessary. A lot of people are not going to take the time to listen to how to be successful. You know what the biggest problem I had with small claims court? Absolutely nothing. I never ran into a huge problem with small claims court. I did have one person, one attorney, because this small claims court was against the company, and because the person went to legal aid, legal aid assisted them. And when legal aid came in, this legal aid representative his name was Mr. Atwater. That fool gave me the hardest time. Literally gave me the hardest time. I mean, gave me such a difficult time that I gave him credit because his difficult time he gave me was procedurally. He used every trick in the book, brought up every single little knick-knack, caused me a lot of problems. And so I conceded to him because he was that good. But other than that, I have not run into a single attorney since I've been doing any of this that's given me a problem. That was better than I was. Not a single time. Attorneys, they're a dime a dozen. They go to law school, they get a practice, and because they have a title, people go to them because they figure he's an attorney, he knows the law. You guys have no clue that attorneys do not know the law. But then that's why you want to sue the actual representative and not the corporation because then you don't have to worry about whether or not the attorney knows the law. You're dealing with that corporate official. And trust me, if they're running a corporation, they don't have time to learn the law. Now, they do have time to learn what new laws have come up with or cases that other companies have gone through or 
going through cases themselves. So they do have that knowledge, but you have one up on them. The only thing you're bringing is a claim regarding whether or not they were required to give you the bond information and whether or not they gave you the bond information. We'll talk about that in the next video of this series, the Empowerment Series, Small Claims Court and the attributes associated with Small Claims Court. We will speak to you guys the next time. Have a good day, everyone.